Hello. Welcome back to the Space Gulag. Today we'll find out what have happened had Obi-Wan been born on Mandalore. Before we begin, special thanks to all of our patrons. The next episode of our miniseries comes out this Saturday. Our story begins on the moon of Mandalore on Concordia. A boy was born to the long-standing clan of Mandalore. Their name was Kenobi. Clan Kenobi was strong. They were rather traditional, though. Being on Concordia, they were separated from the rest of the Mandalorians. Their first son of Clan Kenobi was born in 57 BBY, and his name was Obi-Wan. The second son of Clan Kenobi was born only a short two years later, and his name was Bradham Pod Kenobi. Clan Kenobi was situated on the far side of the moon on Concordia. Clan Kenobi had several issues with other Mandalorian clans and houses. These issues were long-term issues that had been built by generations of centuries of infighting. Clan Kenobi was almost an outcast amongst the followers of the Way, because they were so warrior-centric. When Obi-Wan was born, he became the future head of the clan. The Kenobis were many, but they were also spread out. Some of them existed within the new Mandalore, and lived in Sundari, but Obi-Wan's father cut himself off from that part of the family. Currently, Mandalore was undergoing a systematic change. The powerful house Kreez, led by Adonai Kreez, was working on resetting the Mandalorian way. He and his clan were leading a new era of peace in Mandalore, one that went against the warrior way. Adonai and 56 BBY welcomed his first daughter into the galaxy, that being Satine, and a year and a half so later would be Bo-Katan. Adonai was a personal mix. His political aspirations for Mandalore were of a planet of peace, however he still obeyed the way of his own. Traditional way, that is. Meaning that he still practiced the warrior ways and he wanted to teach them to his daughters. Mandalore, as of right now, was on the cusp of another destruction. Civil wars had been frequent on the planet, and the new Mandalore, growing in Sundari, and Du Kreez, as a de facto leader of the new Mandalore, were working to go against that possible war. On Concordia, Clan Kenobi was outraged by this change in their tradition. It was passed down through generations to be and support the warrior ways, and this was against every systematic belief that they had. But they had two young children, and the Kenobi family knew they needed to focus first and foremost on their family before getting involved in the politics of Mandalore. Plus, Clan Kenobi didn't have to worry about it, considering House Vizsla was the ruling class on Concordia. Their newborn son, Pri, would become the head of the house eventually, though Clan Kenobi had no interest in aligning themselves with House Vizsla. To Obi-Wan's father, Kantanux, the Vizslas were just as bad as the Krees. See, Katanix and Daran, Obi-Wan's parents, had to take up the mantle of their family at a young age. They had fallen in love as young adults, but by the time they reached their early 20s, they were the head of the family, due to premature death of both of their each respective family's head during the conflict on Kavala. The skirmish wasn't even a Mandalorian one. Their family happened to be there for the purpose of peace when a group of pirates blew them away, destroying the landing docks and killing everyone. The irony of the entire situation is that the pirates were paid off by House Vizsla in an attempt to have Adonai Kreez killed, and for that reason, Adonai, who figured out who paid off the pirates, reverted hard into the peaceful ways of Mandalore. On Concordia, as Obi-Wan and his brother Bud and Pod got older, they were introduced to the traditions of Mandalore. This was very similar to what was happening in House Kreez on Sundari. Both Katanix Kenobi and Adonai Kreez were showing their children how to follow the way, though their ideologies were significantly different. Where the Kenobis were taught to follow the warrior way and be true to the way of the Mandalore, the Kreez children were taught the same, with a greater focus on the idea that with great power comes great responsibility. It was early instated into Satine that she would become the Duchess after he passed away, whenever that be, and she would be the next in line for the throne. This was custom by their standards, and because of that, Satine began to grow away from the warrior path, realizing that her life wouldn't allow her the time or the ability to use these things that would be considered traditional to most Mandalorians. Obi-Wan and Bradham, on the other hand, developed an intense bond, though it was forged through combat. Obi-Wan, being the older brother of the two, had to be the strongest, and so this turned into him beating up on his younger brother. It genuinely put a lot of pressure on Kenobi to uphold the warrior ways and be the strongest of his family. Most of Obi-Wan's cousins were significantly older than him, the smallest age gap being 10 years of difference. And because they were Mandalorian, at family gatherings, the children would be thrown into the ring. 
which for Obi-Wan representing his father and mother would be embarrassed. He'd be thrown around and beat up on when he fought his cousins, sometimes so badly that days after fights he wouldn't be able to walk. However, this didn't make Katanix Ardaran lose their faith in their firstborn. Obi-Wan was a fighter, and they knew that, because no matter how big or old his opponent was, he always fought back, even if it cost him physical turmoil. Obi-Wan's parents took a firm liking to their firstborn son, while Brudham was passed off a bit. Mostly this was because Brudham never even got involved in the fighting. He was no pacifist, but he was afraid, and it's something that Katonix and Duran tried to beat out of him, by having Obi-Wan beat up on him. It was pretty dirty, but it's how Clan Kenobi rolled. They didn't mess around, and they wanted their children to be the best warriors across all of Mandalore. When Obi-Wan was of age, he donned the insignia of the Mythosaur, a prideful image of all Mandalorians. And when Brudham was of the same age, he donned the insignia of Clan Kenobi. Brudham was loyal to his clan, but clan loyalty was not just enough for Katonix or Daron. As rare as it would seem, the firstborn was a favorite of this family, whereas typically the youngest child receives all the attention. The first love of the Kenobi parents was Obi-Wan. As Obi-Wan got older, he got more talented, considering Obi-Wan often fought with his parents in a means to achieve his worthiness in the eyes of his parents, he got really good at fighting. As an 8 year old, he was fighting his full grown adult parents but never winning, but always fighting. It was Obi-Wan's weakness, truly his seemingly unattainable quest to please his parents, because they never seemed to show pride in him. They put him down when they, as grown adults, threw him through walls or knocked him out. It was sweet compared to the verbal abuse their other son received, but the physical wounds piled up on young Obi-Wan. His bones were constantly broken and disfigured, and he also received a good amount of head trauma. Of course, when Obi-Wan had broken bones, his parents would help him heal himself, but they'd still make him fight, instilling into him that the way of the Mandalore was never meant to be easy, and in such difficulty, he would find success. For the parents of Obi-Wan, they saw no real issue with their parenting. They believed that their love was helping Obi-Wan become one of the best, not realizing the toil it could possibly take on him. Because behind Obi-Wan's doors, he was obsessed. He couldn't sleep much, he ate rarely, and he rejected any sense of communication with anyone unless it was explicitly violent. Sometimes Brudham would want to play with his older brother, but that 9 times out of 10, unless Obi-Wan had a broken bone, would result in Brudham having his arm twisted out of his socket and his face thrown into a wall. Brudham and Obi-Wan grew apart very easily and quickly after fighting was introduced to them. There wasn't a large gap between the two of them when they were born, but any bond they had established as infants was gone before either of them hit double digits in age. The tragedy of all of it was the fact that Obi-Wan didn't see anything wrong with it. His lust for power and desire to achieve victory felt like they were necessary for him to do. Sure, the physical toll of not eating or sleeping at a young age was heavy on him, but how could he sleep? He wanted to be the best, and the best couldn't rest, even if they were broken. Of course, Obi-Wan eventually got his sleep after being too physically exhausted to go on, which typically would happen after 24 to 48 hours of no sleep, in which he would typically get a solid 12 hours of sleep before being thrown from his bed by his parents. On Sundari, the parenting situation was much different. Adonai Kreese had shown his two daughters the warrior way. Satine, who initially was intrigued by the warrior ways, decided to leave them behind after a bombing ravaged part of Sundari. It was a bomb laid inside of a palace to study for children. The explosion was placed by members of the way, and it claimed the lives of 20. Satine from that point forward forewent the ways of the Mandalore and the warrior tradition. She would embrace what her father politically was trying to stand for. She decided that she, instead of training with her sister anymore, would head to the political capital in Sadari and spend time with the politicians. This drove a wedge between Bo and Satine. Bo-Katan, who was told by her sister that she always loved her, had a hard time believing it. Satine always tried to be loving towards her younger sister, however Bo stopped reciprocating it back towards Satine. Bo focused on the warrior ways, and Satine focused on what she needed to learn for when she eventually rose to power. Satine felt an overwhelming pressure of what would eventually be called her throne. She didn't know what would happen in the time before she was thrusted upon that throne, but she did know that she needed to be ready. Old Mandalorian warrior terrorist attacks were getting more and more frequent, and they were polarizing the people of Sundari. This got so bad that the new Mandalorians, the ones who didn't want to war, became more interested in bringing down the old Mandalorians, so that they could actually focus on this new pursuit of peace. Because truthfully, at this particular time in history, for the first time in Mandalorian history, there were more peaceful Mandalorians 
ones than warrior ones. Tensions were high, but on Concordia, Clan Kenobi kept themselves hidden from the building tension. Their focus was to ensure their sons were ready for whatever conflict came their way. After a family gathering, Obi-Wan was left nearly crippled. One of his vertebrae was snapped out of his position when his 26-year-old cousin slammed him into a pillar. Obi-Wan at this point was only 11 years old, and the pain he was in was excruciating. Broden felt terrible for his brother, but being that he was clearly not the favorite child, he didn't stand up for his brother, mostly because he didn't believe he warranted the ability to actually stand up for him or himself. The few times Broden got into fights with the older cousins, he was knocked out almost instantly. The difference between Obi-Wan and Broden was that when life kicked Obi-Wan down, he fought fire with fire. When life kicked Broadham down, he took it. That was mostly because that's all he could really do. His parents didn't favor him, his brother was stronger and older than him, and every time he got into a fight with any of the family members, he was essentially abused. Broadham was only nine, and to be treated the way he was kept him from feeling like he could ever stand up for himself. Where Obi-Wan couldn't sleep or eat, Broadham was often unable to find inner peace within himself, which, in a way, was similar to Obi-Wan's issues. However, it didn't take such a physical toll, more a mental toll. A couple years later would pass by when Obi-Wan was 15. Mandalore entered another civil war. It started off with the Duke of Mandalore, Adonai Kryze, being killed in cold blood, while defending his people from the old Mandalore. The civil war began and Bo-Katan abandoned her family, leaving Satine by herself, making her the Duchess of Mandalore at 14 years old. She needed the help of someone and she tried reaching out to the Republic which initially was unsuccessful. As the team knew, the Mandalorians had treaties signed with the Republic, prohibiting the Republic from getting involved in Mandalorian affairs. But it was obvious that she was in desperate need for help, and so the Republic sent two Jedi. Master Qui-Gon Jinn and his apprentice, Shock T, arrived on Mandalore to look after the young Duchess. Satine and Shock T were only four years apart in age, and so Qui-Gon decided to put Shock T with Satine and keep the two Jedi and keep the two of them off of Mandalore. Though when Kentonix was informed by good friends within the ranks of the old Mandalorian clans, he and his wife decided that it was time to change Mandalore's fate. The two of them would leave Concordia to track down the Jedi Padawan and the Duchess. The two were careful. If they killed the Jedi, then it would be very likely that the Jedi would send more reinforcements or the Republic would. However, if the Duchess was killed, and being that bo hadn't been seen for weeks, then the chances are that House Kryze would fall and a new house would rise to political power inside of Mandalore. For months, Katonix and Duran would trail behind the Duchess and her Jedi protector. On Concordia, Obi-Wan and Bruttum had to fend for themselves, which as 15 and 13 wasn't as easy or fun as it sounded after the first month of living on their own. Though while they lived by themselves, they built a little bit of a connection back up, without the constant pressure from their parents. Obi-Wan felt no inclination to continually beat the life out of his little brother. Instead, he minded his own business, and Bruttum minded his own business as well. They would from time to time sit in the same room with each other, but neither of them knew how to be brothers when their entire life was built around them being rivals, something they simply just couldn't overcome. On the planet of Dabrun, Katonix and Duran would close in on their target. They had been a number of Mandalorian bounty hunters that were on the trail. Shock T, even as a young Padawan, had done a fantastic job at fending off these insurgents. Shock T and Satine became really close as friends, and their time together, when they weren't fighting off bounty hunters, was really positive. Shock T learned a lot from Satine, and as did Satine from Shock T. When the two Kenobi Mandalorians rained down on their camp in the middle of the night, Shock T was blindsided, mostly because Duran used a knife and completely blinded Shock T by dragging her knife across Shock T's eyes. Katonix captured the young Duchess of Mandalore and used his jetpack and flew off into the night. When the morning came around and Qui-Gon found his apprentice wandering around the camp blindly, they went on a search for the young Duchess. The Royal Mandalorian Guard was panicked about their young leader, considering she was the one heir to the throne left. As they ran through the forest searching for a sign, Qui-Gon tried to help a student who was now completely blind. Qui-Gon knew that the task of training Jacques T would become much more difficult than he would have ever done so before, but he wouldn't give up on his student. 
As the Jedi and Royal Guard came around the forest, they found something truly horrific. The young Duchess of Mandalore was hanging from a tree. The Kenobis decided to make an example of her, and carved into Satine's head was the message in Old Mandalorian script, No Peace. It was a horrific sight to bear, and terror of the sight left the Royal Guard nearly hopeless. The future was in Satine's hands, and now they needed a leader. But firstly, they banished the Jedi, telling them that they should never have been brought to Mandalore to help. The Jedi were never welcome to return to Mandalore, and it would be up to the Mandalore itself to recover from this travesty. Katonix and Duran returned to their homestead on Concordia with lots of pride. They had destroyed the new Mandalorian Duchess, and hopefully their peaceful ways would be extinguished. But when they returned, they were disappointed to learn that Obi-Wan and Brudum hadn't been fighting with each other. And so, for their punishment, they sent both of their boys out on a walk. For Mandalorians, these walks weren't a stroll in the park, they were walks across the barren wastelands of Concordia, a land with no life, no water, no food. This walk would teach their children the lesson, however, it was very common for individuals to take this walk to die. It was something only the strongest could survive, and because it seemed like Obi-Wan was taking the mantle of the older brother, they separated the two brothers and forced them to walk on their own. It was a great disappointment for the Kenobi parents, and they, because of their children's failure to uphold the way while they were gone, abandoned their homestead, burning it all down to the ground. All their children's belongings were burnt as well, before abandoning Concordia and going to the front lines of the Civil War. Obi-Wan and Brudum each had their own Mandalorian armor, and they wore it. However, it didn't mean they would be safe forever. They had to cross the wasteland, and if they survived their journey, they would be worthy of returning to the clan. If one of them made it and the other one didn't, then it would be goodbye forever to the other sibling. The Kenobis were extreme, even by traditional Mandalorian standards, but they were some of the best warriors on all of Mandalore. So was it really a surprise that they were just built different? Not really. Obi-Wan traversed the wastelands for three days, and at the end of three days he saw nothing. He couldn't continue to walk, and he was on the verge of death. Obi-Wan was crawling, sweating in his Mandalorian armor, burning up under the heat of the sun. He was on his hands and knees, crawling towards nothingness. Obi-Wan, before his vision ran out and his world was covered in darkness, saw nothing, to assume that he would ever be redeemed. Obi-Wan woke up into a pouring rain. His body nearly shut down, but the pelting cold rain woke him up from his near-death experience. Obi-Wan immediately removed his helmet and cupped his hands as a means to get as much water as he possibly could. He needed it, and when he got it, it was able to give himself enough strength to get up. He drank as much as he could, and then he used his helmet to pick up as much water as he could to save it for the rest of his walk. Obi-Wan could only hope that his brother survived the wastelands. Obi-Wan knew how fortunate he was, because rain in the wasteland happened once every hundred years. To Obi-Wan, it gave him a profound sense of meaning to life. His vision, of course, was misconstrued. He was having hallucinations, seeing shadows bounce off the ground. The rain saved Obi-Wan, and he got to the edge of the wasteland to find his parents waiting. When he got there, Katonix blasted Obi-Wan in the face with his fist, knocking his son out immediately. Katonix and Duran took Obi-Wan to the new homestead. They didn't want Obi-Wan to be able to find the homestead by himself. The purpose of knocking him out was to ensure that Brudum, if he were to survive, would have to survive on his own merit, not by that of his brother. This entire process would divide the Brotherhood, built while they were off-world assassinating the Duchess. If Brudum survived, then he was worthy of survival. If not, then there would be no purpose in him wasting space. It would force Obi-Wan to fight exclusively other people older than him. Days would pass by after Obi-Wan had awoken, and Katonix would return to the Wastelands with the helmet of Brudum in his hand. Obi-Wan would never find out what happened to his younger brother, but what did actually happen is Brudum had survived, thanks to the rainfall. However, he was still not strong enough to make it to the end, and what Katonix ended up doing was executing his own son, after Brudum asked his father for help. Obi-Wan nor Duran would ever learn about this, not that even Duran would even care. While Obi-Wan picked up the training from here, the war on Mandalore would continue. House Vizsla was trying to become the predominant leader in Mandalore. However, the new Mandalorians were putting up a great fight. Even though the new Mandalorians wanted to be peaceful, it didn't mean they didn't know how to fight. Not to mention, they had superior numbers. The old Mandalorians were outnumbered, but the terrorist attacks on innocent civilians were really making a dent in the new Mandalorian morale. 
However, it rallied the new Mandalorians to fight harder than ever before because their children were reaping the ruins of this war. The new Mandalorians launched a counter assault on the old Mandalore, and they ripped apart the Mandalorians of the way. The Civil War was very costly, killing off nearly half of the Mandalorian population. The war never officially came to a peace treaty or a truce, rather it would just end when the two sides stopped their fighting. The war took a much longer time to come to a close without a leader, and the destruction on Mandalore was so much worse than it initially was before Satine's death. The Mandalorians of the New were looking for the next in line, but no one had seen Bo-Katan since her father's death. She was gone, as far as they knew, and so a leader needed to rise, and into that position came Olmec, who was a pacifist as well. He was much older of a man, older than Adonai Kreese, and much older than Adonai's daughters, but with Olmec having the largest voice on Mandalore at the time, it made perfect sense for him to be thrusted into power. However, he wouldn't achieve the rank of Duke. Instead, he would take the title of Prime Minister, believing it was more fit for him. Olmec didn't come from a powerful political house like Kreese or Vizsla. He simply was a self-made man who worked his way up the political ladder his entire life, and now he was at the very top. His primary focus would be on rebuilding and distancing himself from the Republic. Almac, being the pacifist he was, would invest heavily into rebuilding the infrastructure on Mandalore, and forego the need for a military. Of course, he would continue to fund the Royal Guard, but without the rebuilding of the planet, it was very likely the people of Mandalore would turn against him, and he couldn't afford to do that. The new Mandalore were done with war, and if Almac was seen pouring funds into wartime machines, then he would be thrusted out of power in the blink of an eye. This rule would go on for a couple of years. On Concordia, Obi-Wan would become a fully grown adult, and at the age of 21, he would challenge his father. Obi-Wan had become a brooding individual. Any sense of purity was driven from him when his brother died in the wastelands of Concordia. Obi-Wan wanted to challenge his father so that he could officially become the head of the house. It was simply a title of respect, something that would be seen by every member of the clan, except for the few survivors who still lived on Sundari, as members of the new Mandalore. Obi-Wan's father was disgusted by this challenge, but he did accept it. Years of essentially abusing his son came to the culmination here. If Katonix won, then he would prove to Obi-Wan that he was still no match for his father. However, if Kenobi won, then Katonix would be shamed and have to take a seat as an elder with no real power in the family. Katonix was the older brother himself, and he had three siblings. And with their parents being dead at an early age, he was the patriarch of the family. Anyone could challenge him, but his siblings never did. This was the first time Katonix had been challenged in nearly three decades by one of his own family members. Of course, aside from him challenging members within his family, during family gatherings to prove why he was a patriarch of the family after all. Obi-Wan waited till one of these gatherings because he wanted to have the entire family watch Katonix be beat by his 21-year-old son. Obi-Wan and Katonix took their stances. They'd already been through so much training. Katonix went through the same process as Obi-Wan did, but Obi-Wan was starved as a young man. He wanted this victory, starving being a metaphor because Obi-Wan wanted this more than anything ever. His long-term goal was to become the Mandalore, but right now his main focus was achieving his respect within the ranks of his family. Father and son stood upon opposite sides of the makeshift arena. The two of them moved in slowly. They could use any means necessary to achieve victory. All that mattered is that one yielded, and the other one rose from the combat, victorious. The two of them started, exchanging blows with their fists. Both of them, being so well trained, were able to shed explosive hits from the other. Obi-Wan took an early advantage. Being so much younger, he had the speed and ferocity of a young man, someone who fought with nothing to lose, and that's why Obi-Wan was so deadly. He had nothing to lose. Katonix, on the other hand, had everything to lose. His 30-year-plus reign would come to an end here, and he wasn't going to play nice just because it was his son. The two of them traded blows until it turned into a wrestling match, an aspect of fighting that Katonix specialized in. Obi-Wan knew that he needed to keep distance between him and his father. Obi-Wan was so much taller than Katonix, which wasn't saying much because Obi-Wan wasn't that tall of a man. However, Katonix specialized in closing distance between taller opponents, and after five minutes, Katonix dragged Obi-Wan's arm so far back it snapped in three places and shot out of socket. Katonix didn't stop here, no. As he started to beat down on his son, he kicked the helmet off of Obi-Wan's head. Katonix ran forward, picking Obi-Wan off the ground and slamming him down. 
Obi-Wan looked up at his father, who wailed down on him, beating him with his fists, headbutting him with his helmet. Obi-Wan's nose was incredibly broken as blood gushed from his face. Katonix didn't stop. He wouldn't stop until Obi-Wan yielded, but Obi-Wan wouldn't do that. Obi-Wan kicked up, slamming his father in the backside, throwing him off of him. Obi-Wan stood up. His vision was blurry. He could see clearly out of one eye as he staggered to his feet. His father turned around and growled. Obi-Wan had to play this right. He was so close to being out of the fight. If he didn't stop his father now, there would be no fight anymore. Katonix ran forward. Obi-Wan used his grapple and shot it around his father's legs and tied him up. Katonix fell forward, slamming into the ground. Obi-Wan slid around, slinging his feet forward, kicking his father's head backwards, removing the helmet. Katonix grabbed Obi-Wan's foot and twisted it 90 degrees into the other direction and pulled his foot out from under him. Katonix started swinging violently. Obi-Wan wasn't going to get trapped again as he wrapped his legs around the back of his father's neck and pulled backwards, ripping Katonix's neck backwards. Obi-Wan used his one good hand and put it around his father's chin and pulled back, telling his father to yield. There is no reason that this needed to end with him dead. Katonix tried to move but he couldn't go anywhere. His legs were tied up and he couldn't move. Anything. Obi-Wan had perfectly pinned him down. The only options Katonix had were to yield or simply die and he didn't know if his pride would get the best of him or not. He tried to move, but he couldn't. He really couldn't actually do anything. Obi-Wan looked down at his father and then back up at his family. His father didn't yield. Obi-Wan took a deep breath and ripped his wrist back, snapping Katonix's neck. Obi-Wan stood up, looking down at his father beneath him. Obi-Wan reached down and used his knife to cut the shoulder cape off of his father's back as he pulled it up and wrapped it around his shoulder. Kenobi raised his hand up into the air as his family gathered around him. He was the new patriarch of the family. There was no one, obviously other than a challenger, that could take that from him. Obi-Wan let out a terrible scream that sounded more like a war cry. He was a victor, but to Obi-Wan, it felt like he overcame his greatest challenge. Though, it wasn't like he felt free from his troubles. His father certainly left him with some emotional baggage, but that didn't just go away because killing his father wasn't for revenge, it was for power. The distinct difference was power over his family, because Obi-Wan was now the ruler of Clan Kenobi. But Obi-Wan just looked at his family and limped away. He had a lot of healing to do and a lot of thinking to do, because he controlled the clan. It was his decision what came next. However, his family wouldn't just let him get away that easily. The cousins were not the nicest individuals. Regardless, Obi-Wan got his healing, and while he was doing that, Pre Vizsla rose to the power of House Vizsla on the other side of Concordia, though he wasn't as peaceful as Almac originally thought. Within Vizsla's ranks was the last heir to House Kreez, and her name was Bo-Katan. Though Pre Vizsla had a mission for one of the most elite members of his group, called the Death Watch. Bo-Katan was sent out by Pre Vizsla with her squad of elite members to extinguish the group of Mandalorians that ruled the far side of the planet. Truthfully, Vizsla didn't want to get involved with the Kenobis. They were extreme by his own standards, and he believed it wouldn't be in his favor to interact with them. However, if Bo-Katan could kill them, then technically all of Concordia would belong to House Vizsla, which is something he'd very much so like to do, and accomplish. Bo-Katan didn't know much about Clan Kenobi. She and her sister were from Kalvala, and she didn't actually know that Clan Kenobi had a part to play in her sister's death. Bo-Katan went out with very little expectations, assuming that Clan Kenobi would be a group of restless farmers who got their hands on Mandalorian armor, and they were far from. They were some of the worst, nastiest warriors of all of Mandalore. When Bo-Katan and her night owls arrived outside of Clan Kenobi's location, it was silent. Of course it was, it was the middle of the night. But see, Clan Kenobi was often suspicious. Their long-standing rivalry with House Vizsla ensured that they were always on guard, and there was a guard out. They had prepared for this. Out from the mountain came the guard, and it was Obi-Wan's eldest cousin, and he started blasting away. Immediately, the entire clan rose from their slumber. Obi-Wan was at the biggest disadvantage. His arm was still very broken, and it had just been lodged back into its socket, not to mention the foot that was kind of still dislodged. But as the Patriarch, he leapt from his bed and got ready for combat. The Mandalorians got into a heated exchange. Bo-Katan was very unaware that this was essentially a trap, and Pre Vizsla sent her because he himself was too afraid to face the wrath of Clan Kenobi. Obi-Wan flipped his helmet over his head and ran out the homestead and began to fire away, dropping two of the Night Owls. While Kenobi's mantra was a focus on the physicality of combat, it didn't mean that the Kenobis weren't as precise as the best sharpshooters in the galaxy. 
Obi-Wan clipped Bo-Katan. He could tell she was the leader of the group. She dropped to the ground as her fellow night owls panicked. They were far from prepared. Daron leapt out of the window, ripping her two vibra blades out and slashing the most vulnerable pieces of armor. In between the arms, through elbows, across necks, Obi-Wan limped forward as he was tackled by one of the night owls. There were more Death Watch members that came as reinforcements. Vizsla sent them after realizing in hindsight that the night owls wouldn't be enough for the Kenobis. That wasn't an insult of the Night Owls, rather a compliment to the band of maniacs known as the Kenobis. Obi-Wan kicked off the Night Owl as his cousin was domed in the head and dropped to the ground. Obi-Wan then watched as his aunt too was killed. Obi-Wan got up to his feet and shot down another one of the Night Owls, before he was tackled to the ground by Bo-Katan. Obi-Wan couldn't move his arms, he was trying his hardest, but at this point, not even the adrenaline he had could help him here. It may have worked in the fight with his father, because that all happened in the moment, but right now, after living with these injuries for nearly 12 hours, that wasn't going to work for him. Bo-Katan smashed Obi-Wan's helmet into the ground, knocking his helmet off. He reciprocated by hitting her helmet off of her face as well. Obi-Wan then watched as the Death Watch reinforcements came in and burned his family home to the ground. Obi-Wan's mother looked at him, and then she looked at the few remaining members of the clan as she ignited her jetpack and flew away. Obi-Wan watched as his family abandoned him. Bo-Katan looked down at Obi-Wan, seeing his already disfigured face, and then stopping. She looked down at Obi-Wan and stood up, taking pity on him, looking at her group of allies and telling them that they would take this member back to Pre Vizsla. Obi-Wan immediately tried to break free as he shoved the closest Death Watch member away from him. Obi-Wan knew what would happen if he was brought to Pre Vizsla's house. He would likely be executed, and so he tried to escape. While Obi-Wan was a great fighter, he was no match for this group. He took a knee to the face and was knocked out. When he woke up, he was sitting in the corner of a room, with his hands tied together. He wasn't wearing his armor, and he was wearing nothing but the simple outfit he fell asleep in. Obi-Wan moved his shoulder a little bit. It was still in his socket but he knew it wouldn't take that much to change that. Obi-Wan got up from the ground and looked around. He couldn't figure out where he was, and he hobbled over to the window. He looked out and saw a group of Mandalorians gathered. Obi-Wan turned around when the door opened. It was Bo-Katan. Obi-Wan growled at the sight of her. He remembered her armor very vividly from whenever he was last awake. She stopped and told him that pre would like to see him. Obi-Wan didn't move. Bo told him that they could do this easily, or she could actually break his jaw this time. Obi-Wan stopped. He looked over at her and nodded his head without saying a word. Bo-Katan did have a way with her word, and she took Obi-Wan by the wrist and pushed him in front of her. Obi-Wan looked back at her as she backhanded him across the face, telling him to keep his eyes forward. Obi-Wan still didn't say a word. When they got to the main chamber, pre was chatting to a Mandalorian wearing blue and gray armor, one that turned around and left as Obi-Wan walked in. Bo pushed Obi-Wan to the ground in front of Vizsla as he held out the Darksaber in his hands. He tossed it up and down. Obi-Wan looked back at Bo and then forward at pre Vizsla Vizla stood up, igniting the Darksaber and holding it to Obi-Wan's throat. He asked Kenobi if there was any real reason he should be kept alive. Sliding the Darksaber ever so gently across his skin, opening up the side of Obi-Wan's neck, and immediately sealing it with the immense heat of the Darksaber. pre Vizsla continued, saying that he saw no reason in keeping Kenobi alive, considering that it was Obi-Wan's people who were the real insurgents of the Mandalorian way. It was the Kenobis who took it too far and acted out of Mandalorian customs. Obi-Wan simply looked at Pri. Bo was impressed, genuinely by Obi-Wan. He was just a couple years older than her, and she had seen tough before, but she never really dealt with a Kenobi. Vizsla continued calling out Obi-Wan's clan and telling him that they were a failure to the Mandalorian ways. Obi-Wan, under his breath, told Pri Vizsla that he was just afraid of him. He couldn't come to their home by himself, and he couldn't challenge a single member of the family by himself, because he was afraid. Pre Vizsla raised his leg and kicked Obi-Wan in the side of the head, throwing him to the ground. Vizsla got angrier, telling Obi-Wan that his kind could have destroyed Mandalore. Obi-Wan looked back up and told Vizsla that his people liberated Mandalore. They saved it from his kind. And then Obi-Wan said the cutting blow, telling Vizsla that he didn't deserve the Darksaber. It may have been created by a Jedi named Vizsla, but only the strongest should wield that weapon. And Vizsla, not being Mandalorian enough to face Kenobi, told him that he wasn't Mandalorian enough to fight anyone. Vizsla raised the Darksaber above his head and screamed out, Obi-Wan, in a split-second decision, kicked his foot outwards into Pre-Vizsla's knee, jolting the kneecap backwards. 
He screamed out in pain as the Darksaber fell to the ground. Obi-Wan shoved his hands forward and cut off his restraints with the Darksaber. He got to his feet and grabbed the ancient weapon from the ground and ignited it. Obi-Wan looked at Bo, who raised her weapon at him. She looked at Vizsla, and then Vizsla told Obi-Wan that the blade belonged to him. He had no right to wield the Darksaber. Obi-Wan staggered, shaking off the hit to the head that he had just took, telling Vizsla that if he wanted it, then he would need to take it from him. Vizsla growled, telling Bo-Katan to shoot the Kenobi. Bo raised her blaster and shot. Obi-Wan looked over at Bo with shock on his face. The Darksaber fell from his hands as he watched Pre Vizsla fall to the ground. She shot Pre Vizsla. Obi-Wan too fell backwards. His head was spinning. Bo got over to Obi-Wan's side and called out for someone to help. There were no other Mandalorians in the room to see this occurrence. The only ones that saw anything were the two Mandalorians currently still alive. Help came in as the Mandalorians asked what happened. Bo told them that the man from Clan Kenobi won the Darksaber in combat from Pre Vizsla, but he needed to be healed. The Mandalorians ushered Obi-Wan into the medical room and put him on a medical table and immediately got to work on him. His head had internal bleeding in it and he needed to get back to ASAP or he would die from the wounds. Bo-Katan watched as they got to work on him and then thought back upon her actions. She didn't know why she made the choice. Truthfully, she was only 18 and what Obi-Wan said was very true. It seemed like Pre Vizsla was afraid of them, afraid of the Kenobis. And so, if he was afraid, why should he rule? Obi-Wan showed no fear and Bo respected that as a Mandalorian. Maybe it was cheating, but Mandalore needed to be ruled by someone strong. Regardless, who's to say that once he was conscious again, she couldn't just kill Kenobi for the Darksaber anyways? It's not that she knew that Kenobi's family was a reason for her father and sister being killed anyways, right? Obi-Wan eventually woke up, but he was very confused, not knowing where he was. But bo happened to be in the room. She caught him up on everything, and when he asked what happened, Bo told him that he won the Darksaber. Obi-Wan didn't actually remember this. But what hurt could a lie like this do? Certainly Clan Kenobi wasn't as insane as Vizsla made them out to be. Bo told Obi-Wan that Death Watch now served him and his clan for his action to take down House Vizsla. Obi-Wan jolted from his bed telling Bo that House Vizsla hadn't fallen yet, asking where the Darksaber was. Bo pointed to the table on the side of his bed. Obi-Wan looked over as he felt lightheaded. Bo got to her feet and slowly pushed Obi-Wan back down onto the bed, telling him that there would be time for him to take his mantle. Obi-Wan looked into the iridescent light above him as he faded into his sleep. Weeks later, Obi-Wan would be functional enough to stand on his own, to operate on his own when he got up. He was again greeted by Bo-Katan. She had been by his side for most of the process. Obi-Wan took the Darksaber and his armor as he asked if she had heard anything about his family or anything regarding his family. She hadn't, and Obi-Wan understood. If they lived, they lived. If not, then they were dead to him. It was a simple understanding of it. Obi-Wan rose like a possessed man. Bo watched him as he walked past her. She grabbed his wrist and asked where he was going. He turned back and looked at her and told her that he was going to lead. She released his wrist ever so slowly and watched as he walked out of the room. Obi-Wan walked up to his throne and sent a transmission out to his family's call line, telling them that he killed Pre Vizsla for the Darksaber and Concordia now belonged to House Kenobi. Duran and the five remaining members of Clan Kenobi made their way for the palace, under the belief that it now belonged to them. Obi-Wan waited patiently. By this time, he had mostly healed from his fight with his father and the damage sustained by Vizsla and Bo-Katan. When his family eventually arrived, he brought them into the main room, telling them how happy he was that they were here to join him, how thankful he was for having them in his life. Obi-Wan's mother spoke up, telling him that they were so sorry for abandoning him. Obi-Wan smiled, telling him that it all wasn't their fault, they couldn't do anything in the situation, but it's alright because it was in the past. As Obi-Wan said that, he ignited the Darksaber into his mother's back, and he dropped his wrist, releasing a number of whistling birds from his weapon on his wrist. The four other members of his family dropped to the ground immediately dead. Darun fell to the ground beneath her son, still breathing. Obi-Wan got down on his knee and asked her how she could abandon her own child. She tried to speak, but Obi-Wan dragged his Darksaber across her neck before she could say anything. Obi-Wan knew that his family would be the largest challenge to his rule, and getting rid of them first would allow him the chance to naturally fall into power. 
There was greater business to attend to in his eyes without the distraction of his family. Obi-Wan would spend months adjusting to the Death Watch and understanding their customs. No one would challenge Obi-Wan, but he would become friendly with the person who deserved the Darksaber, the person who actually killed Pre Vizsla and saved Obi-Wan from the blood clot that was in his brain. bo was a secret weapon. She could either be Obi-Wan's poison or Obi-Wan's enforcer. She held herself together, and she didn't fear anyone. With Obi-Wan assuming complete control over the Death Watch, he ruled with an iron fist. He told the members of Death Watch that he would lead them to victory over the new Mandalore. Their inability to be one with the true Mandalorian ways were plaguing the planet of Mandalore to its core. Obi-Wan informed the Death Watch that they would train harder and stronger than ever before and they would take down an overbearing force. It was not by the will of Almac of Mandalore would become peaceful, it was by the will of the Mandalorians of what their fate would become decided. So Obi-Wan began training his Mandalorians in the way of Clan Kenobi, brutal, ruthless, mercilessly. If someone was too weak for the Death Watch, then they would be executed in front of the entire clan. Obi-Wan made them do it to themselves, so that they could learn the importance and strength though what Obi-Wan was forcing them to do was a bit extreme even by their own standards. Obi-Wan didn't go as far as having the foundlings executed, but it was in fights between brothers and sisters. Kenobi didn't want the Mandalore to lose again, and for the most part, neither did the people who were serving under him. The odds were against them, if they didn't succeed, then their way would almost be lost entirely under Prime Minister Almac. Their one mission was to take the fight to Sundari and win. Bo-Katan saw reason to take issue with Kenobi's ways, but at the same time, she didn't want to fight him. Her original plan to kill Obi-Wan after he recovered faded away. Since she was the leader of the Night Owls, she was constantly fighting with Obi-Wan. Of course, these fights were training fights, not actual fights over who would wield the Darksaber. However, the two of them got close through their fighting. Obi-Wan, who grew strong as a warrior within his clan through his hard fighting and some may even say dirty moves, didn't pull them on Bo-Katan. The reason wasn't because he was being nice or going soft, but because as a member of Clan Kenobi, he was fighting for survival. With Bo-Katan, it didn't feel like they were fighting for survival. Instead, it felt like they were trying to better each other, and it's something that Obi-Wan hadn't ever had. Bo-Katan brought out another side within him, and it was all developed during this time alone, which they spent a lot of time alone. The main reason they spent so much time alone is simply because they were the two leaders of the Death Watch. Obi-Wan was essentially the Mandalore at this point, and Bo-Katan was the warrior of the Night Owls. Though, there was a bit of clan turmoil. When word reached the other true Mandalorian clans about Clan Kenobi taking over the Darksaber from House Vizsla, the other clans and houses wanted to take their shot at power. It was a large fallacy within Mandalorian culture, the incurable need to claim the power of the Darksaber. The first challenger came from Clan Wren. However, Obi-Wan, having fully recovered by this point, saw no real purpose in worrying about these challengers, because shortly after he stopped Clan Ren's challenger, he killed the member of Clan Saxon who challenged him, the name of that challenger being Gar Saxon. It was a challenge, but it didn't last forever, when Obi-Wan killed the strong, towering member of Clan Saxon. Obi-Wan's rule over the Death Watch was successful. He never saw Jango, and as the galaxy rapidly changed after the death of Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn at the hands of the Sith during the invasion of Naboo, Death Watch prepared for his attack on the peaceful Mandalorians of Zadari. Kenobi had loosened the reins a little bit on his soldiers, seeing that he was able to get the troops down to the best of the best. Also, Obi-Wan himself had reins on himself, though those were enforced by his leader of the Night Owls. Bo-Katan had her own way with Obi-Wan. It was an unspoken thing, and neither of them addressed it. To be fair, it was a bit awkward. They didn't make it awkward, however, they just didn't make it clear to each other that it was evident, essentially just without the valuable communication needed to address it. For someone like Obi-Wan, it was difficult. He never loved anyone. Not a family member, not another person. He was tame right now, but that by no means meant that he was a joy for his foes. He just didn't know how to release himself. He emitted tension, and how could he not? Childhood trauma ate away at him, but he didn't acknowledge it, and he couldn't. bo on the other hand, was very similar, except she had love for the early part of her life. She was given it by her family, her sister, her father. They all had a large influence on her. However, she shut herself off from those emotions. This little bond between Obi-Wan and Bo-Katan was like two boulders smashing into each other, rigid surfaces that felt like obsidian but on the inside had the possibilities of treasure. 
though before they could ever discover the treasure, Obi-Wan melted up his people for an assault, and they left. For Bo, this was actually a bit painful. She hadn't realized she had feelings, and being blown off had a rough feeling for her, though she wasn't the only one who felt as such. Obi-Wan felt a certain buzzing in his chest, like he'd made an error in his ways. But he was a leader. He thought he had to do only what he could do best for his people, though he didn't realize he could also take care of himself too. But this was a struggle he had never been able to decide or overcome. The Mandalorians left Concordia. They united in great force and they marched on Sindare. The people of Mandalore who enjoyed a couple years of peace were outraged when the Mandalorians came to their home world blasting away. It was a massacre. Prime Minister Almac wasn't prepared at all, and the several years of hardened training done with the Mandalorians under Kenobi, the only fighters with any sort of training to defend themselves in Sundari were the elite guard and Almac, who stood no chance. Most of the people on Mandalore put their armor away or gave their weapons away, believing they had no need for it. And the truth is they didn't until Death Watch showed up. Death Watch came in and showed no mercy, specifically to the Royal Guard of Sindari. They stood no chance, and they got massacred. Kenobi's troops pushed across the capital of Sindari, and at the same time Obi-Wan and Bo-Katan marched into the palace on Sindari. They killed the guards, and once they were dead, Obi-Wan ignited the Darksaber, and within three strikes had Prime Minister Almec to his knees, telling Bo-Katan that he would execute Almec before the entire population by nightfall. Obi-Wan asked that Bo-Katan's night owls clear out the palace, and she nodded her head as her troops entered the palace and took over. The hostile takeover of Sundari was quick, and when the night rolled around, Kenobi dragged Almec out before the population of Mandalore and told them that the way was of tradition. If they did not allow their tradition, then they would become traitors to the way of the Mandalore. The crowd watched as Almec was beheaded in front of the entire population of Mandalore. Obi-Wan told the people of Mandalore that nothing would change other than them embracing their warrior past. Those who desired to be warriors would begin a new life, however Mandalore would not forsake their traditional ways. Kenobi raised the dark saber above his head, and a silent crowd slowly but surely crept up towards a loud overwhelming roar. Several days later, Obi-Wan would be sitting on his throne during the middle of the night. He was thinking silently both of his feet lined up against the other side of his throne. He wondered what would come next. He did it. The impossible task. The time felt like it flew by so quickly, and yet, all he had was this, the throne. All of his life was mounting up to this moment, and yet, at the end, he had nothing but melancholy. The travesty of this situation is that while Kenobi may have achieved everything he was taught to achieve, at the end he won nothing. The goal may have been his, and the destruction that now belonged to him wasn't his. Obi-Wan was taught his whole life to seek challenge, and now he had none of that. There was nothing for him to be challenged by, and there was no one to make him feel as if he had to fight for what he had. In a weird way, it was like nothing. During this internal thought, Bo-Katan would wander into the throne. Being that she was a part of Obi-Wan's top soldiers, she was able to reside within the palace, which had enough rooms to sustain an army. She asked why he was still up. Obi-Wan turned towards her. His head had been facing the ceiling, and he didn't actually hear her come in. He told her that he did it. There was no longer a challenge. She didn't quite understand, as she told Obi-Wan that there were still parts of Mandalore for them to capture. Obi-Wan shook his head. There was so much more than just capturing Mandalore. It wasn't even about Mandalore. Bo looked over at Obi-Wan and asked if he would come for a walk with her. Obi-Wan nodded his head, and the two of them walked throughout the halls. She listened to him, and he listened to her. They shared their thoughts and their feelings. Obi-Wan and Bo walked through this stint in the palace, and it would be the most awkward and fundamentally odd way to express their emotions for each other. It would be a bit slow, but, but it was through their odd, some would say charismatic, and others would say charming demeanor towards each other that their relationship was built. It would be strong enough at its roots, and it would last long enough to see the beginning of the Clone Wars. Without a need to partake in the war within the galaxy, the Mandalorians would stay away from the conflict. From time to time, Mandalore would pick fights with individual planets or systems within their sectors. During the Clone Wars, it led Mandalore into expanding its reign of influence by capturing others. As the Clone Wars came to an end and the rise of the Empire began, Mandalore's strength began to look more like a threat than a neutral power. The Emperor didn't really care much for this. The Empire turned his attention to Mandalore. At first, the Emperor sent Tarkin to the planet of Mandalore. Of course, Tarkin was expertly guarded by the best of the best of the Empire. 
Tarkin told the official Mandalore, Kenobi, that Mandalore had two choices, join the Empire or obliteration. Obi-Wan knew he couldn't forfeit the power of control over his planet to the Empire, but if he did, there was no feasible way for the Mandalorians to fight the Empire. If they tried, they might give him a year or two of siege, but in the end, they would be obliterated. Obi-Wan informed Tarkin after several hours of discussion that Mandalore would join the Empire, but he requested that Mandalore be given as much freedom as he could get, continuing by expressing as the Mandalore that he was the rightful ruler of the planet and that would not change or be changed by anyone. Though Tarkin didn't really care. As long as they pledged loyalty to the Empire and the Emperor, then there wouldn't be any issues. The only requirement for Mandalore to avoid Imperial occupation would be to construct an Imperial Academy, in which they would, and through it send some of their best troops to represent the Empire. The galaxy would undergo a large systematic change, but for the people of Mandalore, the main interest of this story, their lives would be completely changed as a warrior society, surviving and built to last in a galaxy ruled by an iron fist. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Tiger Boy, Darth Revan, Pim Daddy Bane, Darth Cheesy, Apollo, Mad Manus, Dudes, Anakin, 003, Lemon Knight, Flan Van Seas, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Hit 2,000 likes on this video. I don't know what's coming next, but it is. And let's talk about our story. Um, so, I hope you all enjoyed this. I really do. Um, this was a fun story. It was a much more warrior-centric story, and I know you guys have been looking for that. And I don't think you guys expected that with Obi-Wan. Um, and I think that's why I waited till Obi-Wan to do it. I think you guys would have expected that more with an Anakin story. And the fun thing about doing these Mandalore arcs is, like, these Mandalore stories in particular, uh, at least the last two that we did, like the Anakin one and this one in particular, is that with those particular characters, um, Anakin and Obi-Wan, if they're born on Mandalore, I can kind of change up their characters as much as I want. And yes, I'm not saying I'm not going to go back and redo these, but uh, considering we just did a video about Obi-Wan and Satine, um, I, I really felt no need to redo that or retouch that. And I feel like for most of you um, coming into this, we're expecting that. And I, you know, I don't think I did that. I, I think I did very, very much so the opposite of that. And, you know, I wanted to build up Obi-Wan's character. Now, I know something that's going to get said and it's going to get so overlooked right now by the time this video comes out, is what about Anakin? This story is not about Anakin. The title was about Obi-Wan, um, and, you know, I know Anakin's, like, the main character of Skywalker Saga, but, like, as, as, like, for example, as in Andor, Andor is the main character, and Anakin and Vader are never mentioned once. That's kind of the point of the story, right? If I, if I put too much attention on it, it takes away from the focus on the actual story at hand, which is all about Obi-Wan. It's kind of the same thing that happened in the um, Obi-Wan Satine story. It's like, if I take too much attention away from the main story, then you kind of you kind of lose the story, you know? Like, in a story that's like two hours long, yeah, sure, that, that can work. That's like your A plot, your B plot, and maybe even a C plot. However, this is not that. Now, this story is really long, uh, considering I did it in one day. Uh, but this this was not a story that was ever meant to be a two hour long story. This is a story that I only ever wanted to be about Obi-Wan. And that was kind of what I wanted to accomplish. And building up a character and one of my fa one of the fun things that that is like in the story that's, you know, a connection back to canon is Obi-Wan had a brother in canon. He mentions it in the Obi-Wan show. And so I give him a brother in this this video and that was kind of fun. Um, but you know, I, I wanted to show the polarity, because I've talked about this before, my my liking of Satine. Uh, however, it doesn't mean I, I cannot write, you know, this. And I wanted to be able to give that polarity, the difference between, like, writing, like, the Obi-Wan falling in love with um, Satine video that we had a couple weeks ago, and this. Very polar opposite stories, very polar opposite differences. And, you know, I wanted to leave some room for imagination with Obi-Wan and Bo-Katan. I didn't want to set up immediately and say like, oh, they immediately fall in love. I just wanted to make it sound like there's potential for it and that it can really develop into something else where they're, where they're close, but that's up to you. I don't, you know, this story I don't intend on doing a part two to, like leaving it open-ended so you can imagine and have fun with it yourself and be like, well, I think this is gonna happen or I think this will happen. And that's kind of the open-endedness that I left there uh, because I, I personally don't have any real intention of going back to the story. Um, I'm personally content with it. I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, this was a fun video that's very, very much so Mandalorian focused. It's very gritty Mandalorian. I, you know, 
I hope you guys enjoyed it. So anyways, I love you all, spread the love, and I'm going to go drink some water now. And always remember, my friends, may the force be with you.